it's kind of an interesting topic because in some ways, are they sex addicts or are they control freaks? Having been an attorney and also now helping people with negotiations in this topic, it's really a very fine line because they also push people away when it comes to sex. It's, they're very hot and cold when it comes to this. They're very confusing when it comes to sex. I mean, because they're addicted to it in some ways. Of course, they're addicted to the dopamine hit, but they're also addicted to controlling you. It's a really confusing topic when you are in relationship with a narcissist. It's a very riveting discussion. It's a very touchy discussion. It's a very sensitive discussion. If you're new here, I'm extending you a warm invitation, a warm welcome. I invite you to hit that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. This is an ever-growing community of empowered souls, people who are walking this journey with me. And your unwavering support of each other fuels our journey together. This is an intricate web because narcissistic behavior and its manifestations, particularly in the realm of sexuality, can be very, very confusing because some narcissists do indeed exhibit traits of hypersexuality. They definitely use sex to control people. And it can be very intoxicating at the beginning when they're showing you all of this attention and, and they're very, very obviously charming and charismatic and they use it as a means to gain control over you immediately with all of their love bombing. You know, they're admiring you. You know, you take Michael, for example, led him to seek lots and lots of constant admiration, validation through sexual conquest. And his partners often made him feel objectified and used. And so then he struggled to assert his boundaries in the face of his relentless pursuit of gratification. It's very crucial to recognize that this narcissistic behavior is not confined to sexual interactions alone. It permeates every aspect of a narcissist's life. If it's happening in their bedroom, it's happening everywhere in their lives, influencing their relationships, their career, their self-image, and understanding this broader context is really crucial because it's not just their interactions of what's happening there. And so I think a lot of times what they do is that they, they can become addicted to porn sometimes because that's an easier way for them to not have to have emotions involved, or they can become addicted to a person where they can become objectified or people that they don't have to have feelings involved with. Maybe it's people that they hire, right? I've seen that a lot of times too in divorces where they've hired people for sex because then there's no feeling involved, but then not be having sex with the person that, you know, supposed to be having sex with, right? And a lot of times it's because then they don't have to be obligated in having any sort of intimate feeling there. And they don't want to have to be controlled by that other person in any way. They can control the interaction because it's all about control. It's all about supply. They also have that profound sense of entitlement and what they believe they should have or, or shouldn't have. And they believe that they're superior and they're deserving of special treatment. And so sometimes it has to do with the amount of money that they have too. Well, I should have and I, de I get and this belongs to me. And, and people are possessions to them. It can be also very confusing that way. And so many times if you're in relationship with a narcissist and you are a person who's trying to initiate sexual contact with a person and they reject you, that can be confusing because you think, why would they reject? Because most people want 
that, but it's all about control and it's all about supply and it's all about, I will be the one who is handling this. I'm the one who's controlling this situation. They don't want you to control. And if they think you want it, then they're going to make sure you don't get it. Right? So they want to make sure they are the one who's in control. It's all an extension of what's happening outside the bedroom. So you have to understand that their addiction to being in control, their addiction to filling that void that's going on inside of them is the same thing that happens anywhere else in their life. So they're probably sex addicts, but it's also, it's just because they need to fill that void of what's happening inside of them. Take Mark, for example, a high powered executive who constantly belittles his colleague and subordinates to assert his dominance. His narcissistic tendencies not only strain workplace dynamics, but also spill over into his personal life where he demands unwavering admiration and compliance from his partner. And that ripple effect affects narcissistic behavior can be far reaching, leaving in a, a trail of emotional wreckage in its wake. Victims of narcissistic abuse often struggle with feelings of worthlessness and self-doubt trapped in a cycle of manipulation and gaslighting. And that's how it manifests outside of them. So there's hope amidst this chaos by arming ourselves with knowledge and effective communication strategies, we can reclaim our power and break free from the cycle and the grips of narcissistic abuse. It starts with setting boundaries. It starts with prioritizing our own well being. It starts with saying, you know, I'm worth more than this. If you are in the process of dealing with this right now, this is where you start to say, I know that I'm worth more. I know that I'm better than this. And that's why you're here. That's why you are watching this right now because your soul, your inner voice said, I know I'm better than this. And that's why you were compelled to watch this right now. And I know that your soul is speaking to you and you you know that you're worth something greater than yourself. So sex and narcissists. This is one of the lesser discussed, less talked about, less information is available on how narcissists actually use sex to control their victims. But it is absolutely happening and it's something that we should be discussing more. In fact, sex is one of the most common ways that narcissists use to gaslight their victims. It's highly personal, it's very insidious, extremely toxic. It, nobody knows what's happening because it's happening behind closed doors. So it's one of those areas that no one's going to see, which makes it a perfect way for narcissists to abuse their victims. It's highly personal. It's extremely embarrassing for people. So people just end up not talking about it. Or maybe they just actually think that there's something wrong with them because that's what the narcissist wants you to believe. If you think that this is a really crappy way for narcissists to control their targets, give me a they suck in the comments. Narcissists use many different ways to psychologically abuse their targets. If you want to know more about the different types of tactics that narcissists employ for control, check out my video on narcissist manipulation tactics. Because sex is such an important part of who we are as human beings, and you know, especially with your romantic partner, you want to feel attractive, you want to feel like your romantic partner desires you, and so, of course, because that's something that you want, it's a perfect place for the narcissist to make sure that they control you and coerce you in this area. So the people who are in relationship with narcissists end up feeling used, abused, discarded. Um, you, you end up feeling um, less desirable or maybe not desirable at all. Um, what happens in the bedroom when you're in relationship with a narcissist is that your needs are completely irrelevant, just the same as they are anywhere else. 
They set you up so that you feel like there's something wrong with you and you end up feeling ashamed and it affects your confidence and it affects your self-worth. And it's something that ends up being so private and so personal that you end up feeling very, very isolated because it's embarrassing. You don't want to have to admit to your friends or your family or even to a therapist that maybe your spouse doesn't want you, doesn't desire you, or that maybe you no longer desire that person because of the way they've made you feel, because of the way they've made your needs completely irrelevant. When you're in a sexual relationship with a narcissist, they communicate to you the message that your pleasure isn't important, that only their pleasure matters. And they subtly let you know that if you want pleasure or if you want anything out of the romantic relationship that you're being greedy or maybe that there's something wrong with you for wanting that but the bottom line is what's really going on is that narcissists use it as a form of supply because remember narcissists have no inner sense of value they have to derive all of their value from the external and that external value that they are sucking from all the people around them, we call narcissistic supply. It's their oxygen, it's, the, it's what they feed on, it's their food. Um, because they, they're constantly trying to feed this beast and layer on this external value to slap onto the fact that they have no inner sense of internal value. And they have no ability to care for another person. So if they have no ability to have empathy or care for another person, it does not make them good sexual partners because they certainly don't care about your needs, your desires, your wants. So narcissists use sex as a form of narcissistic supply. Remember that supply can come in the form of, you know, big house, big car, the best schools, the right friends, the prestigious job, but narcissistic supply can also come in the form of control, gaslighting, devaluing, debasing, you know, cutting people down, minimalizing them, marginalizing them, and making them think that they're crazy. So here you are in a situation where it's the most vulnerable. When you have a sexual relationship with somebody, it's a very, very vulnerable thing. It's a very vulnerable position to be putting yourself into. And so whenever you expose vulnerability to a narcissist, that becomes an excellent place for them to go after. Because anytime you show weakness or show something that you want to a narcissist, that becomes an immediate place for them to target. They're always looking for weaknesses, always looking, trolling, 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 looking for ways to control people. And they can control people in areas where they are feeling vulnerable or uh, exposing themselves or exposing anything that you want to a narcissist. That becomes a place where they can maybe get that from you. And so when you're negotiating with a narcissist, it's the same thing. You know, you never let on exactly what it is that you want and, and you try to steer them away from that because you know that that's the one thing that they're going to go after. But in a sexual relationship, you can't really play those games as much. I mean, you're obviously, you're in a sexual relationship, so you want to feel desirable. You want to feel like your partner wants to give you pleasure and vice versa. That's, that's the whole basis of a sexual relationship. But when you're in partnership with a narcissist, you're never gonna get that. Just the same as any of the relationship with the narcissist, the, the, the sexual part is actually just one component. It's one, one more area for them to gaslight. It's one more area for them to control. One more area for them to make you feel less, for them to devalue you. But it, it becomes very, very personal and it, it, it hurts way down into your soul because you, you don't feel desired by the one person you want to feel desired by. So it actually manifests itself in a number of different ways, which we're going to cover in parts two and three of this series. This is such an important topic that I decided to do it in three parts. And today was just the first part where we're just kind of giving you the basis 
of what's really going on in a sexual relationship with a narcissist. Sexual abuse when you're dealing with a narcissist comes in different stages. In the beginning, you've got your love bombing stage and that's when they will just want to claim you. They'll say that you belong to them, that you're beautiful, that you're smart, that you're intelligent, that you're handsome, that you're gorgeous, that you are completely everything that they've ever wanted in a partner. And so you, how can you resist? How can you resist their charm in the beginning? But that love bombing stage is actually a way of claiming you, claiming you as their property. And once they've brought you into their lair, then the devaluing starts. And that's when you start seeing these little things about how, how, you, how you are in the bedroom is wrong in some way. That maybe you're, you're selfish. Maybe that you're too promiscuous. Maybe that you're wearing the wrong clothes. Maybe that you were talking to the wrong people. You know, the, 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 the control then starts setting in because the love bombing is really just a way of gathering you into their layer of control. The next stage that you'll see is jealousy and rages. And this is where they'll start demanding to know everything they need to know or they think they need to know about your past partners, about the kinds of sexual encounters that you may have had before. What, what did you do with that person? Who was it? Who did you talk to? When were you with them? What did you wear? All these sorts of things. The, the jealousy and the rages then start. And if you tell them that they're being irrational or that they're crazy, then that's going to, boom, inflame them because that narcissistic injury will be triggered and the narcissistic rage will come flying out. So you can't say that because that's going to be perceived to them as disrespectful or a criticism. Even if they are totally crazy, there's nothing to be jealous about. There's nothing to worry about. Part of this jealousy phase is also being jealous of anyone or anything that seems to interfere with your attention toward them. They want to have full attention. So even if it's your children, your, um, you know, if you have children with somebody else or your parents or your best friend, they want full attention and they will not accept it if they don't get your full attention. The next phase is coercion tactics. And with coercion tactics, what you'll start to see is demanding sex at certain times, demanding sex after an argument so that you, they can prove, you can prove their commitment back to them. Demanding sex after an incident when they think that you've been talking to somebody that you shouldn't have or that you were wearing something that you shouldn't have than demanding sex to have control back over you with that. Sometimes they play the victim card where, you know, if you want to prove to them that you love them, prove to them that, that you're, they're, they're the only one so that you feel that you have to have sex with them in order to make them feel safe again, to validate them, to make them feel secure. The next stage is threatening infidelity. You know, if you don't give them what they want, if you don't have sex with them in the way they want, if you don't do the things sexually with them that you want, that they want you to do, then they might threaten, hey, I'll just go get it somewhere else. Hey, all these other people want me. So, you know, if you don't give it to me, I will find it somewhere else. Another thing that you might see is the pushy stage where they're trying to push you into doing things that maybe you weren't comfortable with. Maybe you don't want to do because they're, not comfortable. Maybe it's something out of your zone that you don't want to do, like a threesome or some, you know, S and M thing, or just even certain positions that you're not comfortable with. Well, then that becomes a threat as well. You know that there's nothing. There's it's never enough. That they're pushing you into doing things that you don't necessarily want to do, and if you don't comply, then you are threatened with that they're going to go to somebody else, they're going to lose you or something like that. And another thing that you'll see with narcissists and sex is unsafe sex. So maybe they will push you into doing things that are not safe, such as having unprotected sex or having sex where you potentially could get caught 
or maybe giving you a, a sexually transmitted disease. I've actually seen that as a divorce attorney where uh, you know a husband or a wife cheats on the spouse, they go get a sexually transmitted disease, they know that they have it, they've been diagnosed with it, and then they end up going and having sex with their husband or wife then and giving them that sexually transmitted disease. And in a lot of states, that's actually cause for civil action, such as assault or battery or inten intentional infliction of emotional distress. Because especially if you end up with something like herpes, you, you know, you're gonna have that virus for the rest of your life. There's no cure for it. There are medications for it, but there's no cure for it. But that's the kind of thing that narcissists will do. Another thing that you'll see with this is that narcissists will maybe withhold sex or withdraw from sex as a way of coercing or controlling their partner. You know, I've actually seen women who will say, I've actually been at lunches where women will say, I stopped having sex with my husband. I told him that I'm not gonna have sex with him until he does this thing that I want him to do. That's another way that they use sex as a weapon of, as a method of control. And if you're dealing with a malignant narcissist, you might see violence. You might see violent sex. You might see uh, sex that's completely you know, unsafe. You might see rape, degrading sex, or s sadistic sex. And if you think that this is so wrong, give me a so wrong in the comments. And if you are dealing with any of the things that I mentioned in this video, please check out my other videos to help you. One is self-care to cope when dealing with narcissists, and I'll put a link to that below. And another one is escaping hell, how to leave a narcissist for good, parts one and two. And I will definitely put links to those videos below as well. And if you're getting ready to negotiate with a narcissist, check out my free Crush My Negotiation Prep Worksheet uh, it, I will drop a link to that below as well, but you can just grab it at winmynegotiation.com. Also, it will definitely help you. Do not walk into your negotiation without it. And if you want additional support and you want to connect with other people who are dealing with narcissists, please join my free private Facebook group. It's called Narcissist Negotiators, and I'll drop a link to that below so that you can just click and jump on in there and connect with many others who are dealing with exactly what you're dealing with. So if you've watched parts one and two in this series, then you know that narcissists use sex as a way of controlling and gaslighting their partners. And if you haven't watched part one and two of this series, now is a good time to go back and make sure that you do that. But one of the things that you should know if you haven't watched it is that narcissists need an endless amount of what we call narcissistic supply. And supply is anything that feeds their ego. Narcissists have no internal sense of value whatsoever. They're like the hollow chocolate Easter bunnies. You know, they look good on the outside, but there's nothing going on inside. So what they need is an endless amount. It's like this black hole that can never be filled of trying to suck as much out of the people that are around them to try to make themselves feel better. It's an endless quest, endless quest of trying to feel better, trying to feel better, trying to feel better, and they never can, never can, never can, because there was something that was broken deep inside of them long ago when they were children, some kind of traumatic event or something took place that broke inside of them where they said, hey, I'm broken, there's something wrong with me, I am scared, I am vulnerable and the only way that I'm going to be able to cover up that there's something seriously wrong with me is by an endless amount of narcissistic supply. So supply is anything that feeds their ego. It could be money, it could be compliments, it could be prestige, but it also has a darker side. The darker side of supply is control and doing anything they can to feel a sense of control over another person, or a sense of making the other person feel less than they are, or that more importantly, that they are better, that they are higher, that they're um, perfect in some way. And so this endless cycle 
goes on with narcissists in every aspect of their lives. So why would their sex life be any different? Well, it's not. It's not. It's actually a perfect little chasm, a perfect little place that is uh, a, a, a smaller area of what goes on with everything else. But with narcissists and sex, it's a perfect place for them to exert control over the other person because the person is vulnerable to them. Because when you're with your romantic partner, you want to appear you know, desirable. You want to be attractive. And you know, so you're being vulnerable. You're exposing yourself to this person. And that is a perfect place for a narcissist to zone in and hurt you and, and, and use that as a way of controlling you and gaslighting you and psychologically abusing you. When narcissists are dealing with sex, one of the things that you'll often see is they become sex addicts because it's a way for them to try to feed that beast. And so if people are saying that they're so attractive or that they are, or they want them in some way, then they want more and more and more and more of that. So they end up having many different conquests to show that, look how attractive I am. I actually did a deposition of a, a wife's boyfriend one time. I was representing the husband. And right in the middle of the deposition, the boyfriend says to me, ask me how many women I've been with. And I'm thinking, I don't really care how many women you've been with. I'm trying to find out if you're paying for stuff for the wife, you know? And he says, he was a Spanish guy, and he's like, ask me how many women I've been with. Go ahead, ask me. And I'm like, I, I don't care. It's, um, so I wouldn't ask him. And he says, a lot of women, a lot of women. Like, so he, because I wouldn't ask him, he just decided to volunteer the information. And you know, here is a perfect example of a person who was using the fact that he had been with a lot of women to beef up his ego, to make him feel more important, make him feel like he's more attractive to everybody. And so when you're dealing with narcissists, you see that where they have multiple conquests and um, become addicted to sex in that way. Another way that they do it, which is kind of like the opposite of that, is they actually have no sex with anybody at all because they're addicted to porn or, or masturbating on their own because they don't want to be controlled by another person because they can't have intimacy with another person. They don't want to have vulnerability with another person. So that's another thing that you'll see with narcissists sometimes as well. A lot of times what you see with narcissists is that they will start having other kinds of conquests too, such as uh, with prostitutes and things like that. I mean, sometimes they have a perfectly loving spouse at home, but yet you see them off with prostitutes because that's a way of them feeling more attractive, of feeling dangerous, of taking risks, of um, being with someone who's going to be willing to do the kinds of things that they weren't, the, the spouse maybe isn't willing to do. Because you do see that with narcissists sometimes where you know they expect more and more and more from a spouse and if they don't do it, then they tell the spouse, well, I'm just gonna go find it somewhere else then. And you know, it, it's a way of controlling the spouse by saying, hey, if, 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 if you're not willing to do S&M with me or you're not willing to do a threesome or you're not willing to engage in these crazy positions or you know, I've seen situations in divorces where the husband was forcing the wife to uh, have sex with another man while he watched. Um, and he set up video cameras in their bedroom so he wasn't there when it happened but he wanted her to go out, find someone, have sex with this person in their bedroom with the cameras on so that he could watch. And she didn't want to have to do that anymore. That is a perfect example of somebody who is being psychologically abused by their spouse. And if you think that this is just not okay, give me a not okay in the comments. So just remember that sex 
and narcissism are symbiotically intertwined with each other. Very often, narcissists use sex as a way of gaslighting their partners, psychologically abusing their partners, exerting control over their partners, and making their partners miserable and causing drama, trauma, and chaos for their partners. And if you are seeing this and you are just so ready to get the hell out of this relationship, in this video, I'm gonna give you five things narcissists withhold to torment you. So one of the things that narcissists love to do is they love to manipulate you. They love to control you. They love to see you squirm. Something that I have often said when it comes to dealing with narcissists is that there's this huge myth out there. People think narcissists just want to win. That myth is totally false. And so when people go to negotiate with narcissists, they go to communicate with narcissists, they go to try to deal with narcissists, they think, I'll just give it to them. I'll just give them what they want and then I'll be free. Why am I not free? Why am I still in this? Why are they still driving me insane? Because the problem is that it isn't just that they want to win. It's not just money. It's not just power. It's not just the optics of it. It's also that they love to manipulate you. They love to see you squirm. They enjoy, they actually literally get a high from seeing you squirm. They actually enjoy that process. So I talk about that there's actually two different forms of narcissistic supply. There's actually what I refer to as diamond level supply, which is how they look to the world. It's, it's what they will protect and defend at any cost. So their reputation, it's adulation, it's admiration, it's their impressive friends, it's prestigious careers, it's all that stuff, how they look to the world, it's respect, you know, that sort of thing. But then there's what I refer to as sort of like the dark underbelly of narcissistic supply. And this is what they don't necessarily always show to the world, but what they really kind of show to their, their supply source, the people around them, the people closest to them, the people that they're controlling, the people that they're manipulating. And this is what I re refer to as coal level supply. So diamond and coal. And this is devaluing people, debasing people, denigrating people, making people squirm. Withholding is one of those sources. They literally get off on it. It literally gives them a high. And I kind of liken it as to like that kid who is taking a pin to an earthworm. You know, I kind of picture like that kid in the, in the, in the woods when kind of growing up by the creek, you know, who literally enjoys watching the, the earthworm kind of squirm or whatever and see what happens. It's almost like an experiment or something. They got, oh, wow, look, look at that. Look at that. They, they literally don't think about the fact that the earthworm might be feeling that or might be having feelings about it or whatever. They don't see that. They don't see what's happening on the other side of it. They're just enjoying the process of watching you squirm and be tormented. And, you know, they're getting a rise out of you because they know then that they still have power over you that they still have control over you, that you are still in their dominion in some way, that they still have reign over you, that you are still tied to them in some way. And so they, they withhold things to torment you. So what kinds of things do they, they withhold from you? So number one, the first thing that you'll start to notice right away that they'll, that they'll be withholding from you is affection. And why is this one of the first things that you'll notice? Well, because one of the first things that they give to you in such a massive, huge way is affection. 
So, you know, especially if you are in a romantic relationship, you know, they come off they, you know, where, where they start, start with the relationship with a massive amount of affection. It's almost overpowering. The intensity is insane. So, you know, you start off with almost, you can't breathe, sweep you off your feet, amounts of affection. And you think that you're, you've met your soulmate and they make you feel like you're the most incredible human being on the planet and they can't get enough of you. You're just getting text messages and emails and they're talking to you all the time. And they're telling you how you're just the most incredible person that they've ever met. And it's on and on and on. And they just like, they're breathing you in. It's just constant, constant amounts of affection at the beginning. You know, you're planning the rest of your life together and the whole thing. And really, honestly, it's the same way in a business situation too. It's just not the same type of affection, you know, in a business situation, because, you know, I know because I had a business partner who was a narcissist, a covert narcissist, they don't come on with the whole, you're so beautiful, you're amazing or, you know, whatever, but they, they start off by saying, wow, you're so smart. You're incredible. You have amazing business contacts. I love all your background. You know, I can bring all this to you. They love bomb you in different ways. But then what they do is once they lock you in, once they get you to that next level, that withholding comes right away in the form of ghosting. That happens almost immediately. So right away, as soon as they lock you in, all of a sudden, you can't get a hold of them. Text messages stop for, for an entire day or two days or whatever. And now when you question them about it, all of a sudden you're needy. All of a sudden you're a hanger on. All of a sudden you are, what is your problem? I'm working. I had things to do. They turn on you as if you're the crazy one for even expecting them to be responsive. I've got other things to do other than you, you know, so that withholding of affection starts almost immediately, almost immediately. They're not telling you all of those wonderful things that they were saying about you at, from the beginning. They're not giving you the compliments. They're not touching you as much as they used to. They're not kissing you back. All of those things almost immediately stop right from the beginning. So I'm not even talking just about communication. I'm talking about all forms of affection, they start to withhold unless they start to realize that you're pulling away and then they start giving it back again. You know, it's this push, pull, push, pull, high, low, high, low, hot, cold, hot, cold. And then you go through that cycle for the rest of the relationship, frankly, you know, so that's withholding, withholding affection, giving affection, withholding affection, giving affection. So that's number one. Number two is withholding the truth. They will definitely withhold the truth. And then, you know, they'll say, oh, I didn't lie about that. But they will also not necessarily tell you the truth. They will certainly lie about pretty much everything as well. But they will also not tell you entire truths as well. So what I mean by that is they might give you information about what they did in a weekend, but they just don't put in all of the details. Or they might give you information about some kind, if, if, if it's a work situation, they might give you information about what they want to give you information on, and then they omit details that they just don't want you to have. And then you find out later what they didn't tell you, which is, you know, 
probably the most critical part. And a lot of times it's to protect themselves, but sometimes it's just to torment you. And one of the ways that I would see this often as an attorney is with discovery, for example. You know, they would hand over, you know, if it's supposed to be 12 months of bank statements, they would hand over 11 months worth. And so, you know, you have to go through and you realize oh, July is missing. So then you have to go back and you have to ask for July. They would only provide the first page and not the rest of the pages. So you'd have to go back and you'd have to ask for the rest of the pages. Or they would only provide this bank and not the rest of the banks. And you'd have to go back. And, then, and you know that they're doing it simply just to torment you, simply just to laugh, simply just to like make you have to score, make you have to do the work, make you have to go through the extra steps, right? It's that sort of thing. So that, those are the kinds of things I'm talking about with withholding the truth. It's not lying, but also not telling the entire truth. So that's number two. Number three is the one that I actually find to be one of the more bizarre things when it comes to dealing with narcissists, but there it is, which is sex. Narcissists will literally withhold sex from their partners. You would think that they enjoy having their partner want to have sex with them, want their partner to want them, they are very strange when it comes to that. I don't know, but they don't seem to like it when their partner is initiating sex uh, with them. So it, it's, it's a very strange thing. I've actually did a whole video on narcissists and sex. It's, it's a, a definitely a control issue. Even men you know, they don't like their females to be initiating sex with them. And, you know, they don't like kissing. They don't like that intimacy. They withhold sex to torment their partners, They to torment you. And let me just tell you, you deserve better. I, you know, I think a lot of times empaths there was a lot of trauma in our backgrounds as well as empaths and because of that we feel like we only deserve a certain amount of affection or we only got used to a certain amount of affection in our lives and it, you know it's hard because you become trauma bonded to a certain person and this hot cold thing is part of the way you become trauma bonded as well. And so it's it's a very difficult thing, you know, this whole sexual thing. You deserve better. You also need to get psychological help and support from others around you. But let me just ask you to right now put in the comments, I deserve better. I deserve better because you do. You deserve better. All of us deserve to live our best lives. We deserve to live life to the highest intention that God intended for our souls, which is amazing. And it is not to be squashed. It is not to be made small. And nobody deserves that. And people treat people in a way that is commensurate with the way they feel about themselves. So if people are treating you poorly, it is because they feel poorly about themselves inside. It has nothing to do with you. So you cannot take it personally. And sex is one of those things that it's, it's hard not to take personally because you feel like, oh my God, I must not be attractive or whatever. But I want you to know it has nothing to do with you personally, okay? So I just want you to say, I deserve better in the comments right now. And if you need additional support, I have a free private Facebook group 
please join that narcissist negotiators with Rebecca Zung. And I do also have a partnership with an online counseling service, BetterHelp. Please, if you don't have access to counseling, go to betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung. We get commissions from it. It doesn't cost you any extra. We just want you to have access to the help and support that you need. Number four, the next thing that narcissists do is they withhold genuine praise. You know, they may say good things at the beginning to love bomb you. They may also say good things in public to make themselves look good about you, but in private, no. And also, you know, especially with covert narcissists, there's always sort of that underlying competitiveness, that underlying jealousy, you know, and even with grandiose narcissists as well. And so, you know, you know that there's always sort of like, they're, they're not feeling good about you. You know, they may say, hey, you look great, you look beautiful or whatever, but there's always sort of this agenda. Remember, everything they do is a manipulation. Keep that in mind and remember that. They withhold genuine praise. They're jealous. They're jealous of you. That's number four. Number five, and by the way, if, if you're being subjected to any kind of narcissistic rage, you know, if they get upset, I do have key phrases for disarming narcissists. You can go to disarmthenarc.com and get those. Disarmthenarc.com and get the key phrases for disarming narcissists. So that's that. Number five is obvious, very obvious. One of the major things that narcissists withhold is resources, money, information, you know, social, emotional, informational, financial, you know, any kind of resources that they think that you're going to need, then they will withhold that, you know, whatever it is that they think that you want or you need, they don't want you to have access to it. They will withhold that from you, especially in negotiations, especially when things are breaking down. Because, you know, narcissists are either for you or against you. If things are breaking down, if you're going into that discard phase, then they think that you are against them and then you become public enemy number one, all right? And so th that's when they're going to go after you and they're going to go after anything that they think that you want. All right, so today we're going to be talking about narcissists and sex. And specifically, by the end of this video, you're going to have 10 signs that you may be in bed, literally, with a narcissist. And it's important because when you're negotiating with them, actually, it spills into, you know, all areas of your life. And honestly, it's just an extension of the rest of your world. It's no different than how they are in any other aspect of your life. They are narcissists everywhere else. It doesn't change when you get between the sheets or when that bedroom door closes. It's really just an extension of it. And in some ways, it's even worse because there's no audience. There's no one else to see what's going on. So, you know, let's think about the fact that we are dealing with a person that has no sense of self that is extremely, extremely insecure, very, very fragile. They need constant adulation. They always put their needs first. They don't care about other people because they are, you know, in constant survival mode. They, very, very fragile people. Insecurity to the absolute extreme. So what would be sign number one? Sign number one is they always put their needs first, of course. They never put your needs first. It's always their needs first. So, you know, if that is something that you see happening, well, hmm, that may be a red flag for you. So that's 
definitely number one. Number two is even a little bit more sinister or, you know, something that may be going on, which is they withhold sex if you don't necessarily behave in a way that they want you to in other aspects of their lives. I actually knew a couple where if the husband didn't do certain things that the wife wanted, she would definitely withhold sex. I mean, and she was a covert narcissist. And so, you know, you would see him scrambling to do things and she would brag about it to other people, which was a shaming technique that she would use, which is really horrible. But that was something that she would do. And he lived in that in that space. So withhold sex, if you don't behave in a way that they want in other aspects of your life, they use it as a reward or punishment. So that's number two. Number three, is they criticize you. They criticize what you look like. They criticize you physically, either directly or indirectly. It may be passive aggressive. I had a family member once where the husband actually gave her an abdominizer for her 30th birthday. Like it was a, a piece of exercise equipment to make her abdomen like more strong or taut or whatever to give her abs um, because I guess she had just had a baby and she didn't have the same kind of abs that she once did. Not a very nice gift. That, that's a passive aggressive move. I've heard um, of a couple where one of the uh, people in the, in the couple said to the other person, oh, you, you know, you better be careful about eating that kind of food with your propensity to gain weight. You know, you may not be as uh, attractive at that point. Uh, I certainly am not attracted to people who are overweight. I have actually had people say to me, uh, we are getting a divorce because I'm not attracted to people who are overweight. So they may criticize you outright physically. That's something that they may do as well. And, and you know, shame you sometimes physically as well. So that's number three. Number four is they will refuse sex if you ask for it. They want to be the one to initiate it. They don't want you to initiate it. They want to have control over it. And then if you try to initiate it and they say, you know, you say you never want it if I initiate it, They'll actually even gaslight you and say, that's not true. That's not how it is. I love it when you initiate it. And then when you try to, it never works out. And they'll say, well, it just so happens that this time I'm this way. Or, you know, they gaslight you, make you think you're crazy and say that that's not how it is. That it never it happens that way. That they always say that they want it when, when you ask for it. Something to that effect. So they refuse to give it to you. If you ask for it, they always have to be the one to initiate it. It's a power move. It's a control move. They want to be the one in control of it. They don't want you to have control over that. They feel like if you have that power, then you're somehow manipulating them. It's all part of an extension of what's going on in the rest of your world, honestly. So that's number four. Number five, is they want lots and lots of praise. They need that adulation. They need that praise. So if they do anything for you at all, you know, you get any anything out of the situation there, then they want lots of praise about how great they were, how good it was for you. Look at how lucky you were that it was good for you at all. They want lots of praise for that. You were so lucky that it was so good. And, you know, you, you better like heap it on for them. And number six is, you know, kind of the converse of that, which is they will react very, very poorly if you criticize anything at all about what went on in there, if you don't like something that they want to try or that they did try or that they did do, 
if, if there's anything that happened that they tried or that they did and you criticize that, they react very poorly. It's just the same as in any other aspect of your life, right? You try to criticize something. They don't take criticism very well. They have that very, very fragile ego. They react poorly to criticism. They've got that narcissistic injury that can get triggered. You know, remember, by the way, never call a narcissist a narcissist. I have a whole video on what to do instead of calling out narcissists. And you can definitely check out that video, by the way, do this instead of calling out narcissists. So anyway, that's number six, never actually criticize anything that they do. They don't like that. Well, I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying they don't like it when you do that. Number seven, they feel entitled to sex. They use it to control you. That's number seven. They feel entitled. They use it to control you. They feel like they should be able to have it whenever they want. And by the way, I do want to mention that if you are in a relationship that is not serving you, where you feel that you are in a situation that you are giving permission to be in, and perhaps maybe not even in a safe situation, uh, we will make sure to have the domestic violence phone number uh, listed below. Definitely get out of that situation, especially if you don't feel safe. You should definitely not remain in that situation. You should never, ever, ever remain in a situation where you don't feel like you are giving your consent to be in this relationship. Okay. So I say number seven, they feel entitled. They use sex. They use it to control you but you should never give yourself to a situation if you don't feel that that is something that you want to do. Okay. So that's number seven. Number eight is if they cheat often, sometimes they do, they will blame it on you if they do cheat. And if they don't cheat, they will either give themselves props for not cheating. Look at me. I'm not cheating. Other people cheat. I should be rewarded somehow for not cheating as all these other people do. Or if they haven't cheated, then they, sometimes they may threaten to cheat because you aren't behaving the way you should. And if you don't do something that I want or stop doing something I don't want you to do, then I'm going to cheat. So they'll use it as a threat. So that's something that you'll see that cheating is somehow involved in the conversation, either to hang over your head in some way, or maybe they actually do go out and cheat. All of this, by the way, just sucks your energy. It just sucks at your soul. It just is so draining and it just, it doesn't make you feel alive. Part of a healthy relationship should be a healthy physical relationship that serves you and makes you feel alive and makes you feel like you're part of a relationship that is serving two people and, and makes you feel like you are both honoring and respecting each other. And this is not that. And so, you know, when you're in this situation, right? I mean, these are energy vampires. And if you are agreeing with me right now, give me an amen in the comments. All right. So number nine, number nine is they'll often accuse you of cheating. So, you know, number eight was, you know, either they're cheating or they're going to threaten to cheat. Number nine is they'll accuse you of cheating. Or they'll say, oh, they act very, very jealous. Or they'll compare you to other people or other partners that they've had in the past. That's something else that you, you may see. You know, they're very, very insecure people. So they're constantly worried about other people, what's going on, all that sort of thing. So that's number nine. And number 10. Number 10 is they make you feel guilty. If you don't show them enough attention, you don't shower them enough, you don't touch them enough, you don't tell them how great they are, 
you know, tell them how good they look. It's got to be in like a constant, like flow of energy, that direction, the way they need it, the way they must feel they, they have to have it. And it's very little about your feelings, very little about your needs and very little flow your direction. So that's really it in a nutshell. Those are the 10 signs that you may be having sex with a narcissist. And so I really want you to take us back to to the beginning of the relationship, how they love bomb you to death, how they want to quickly get to that next level as quickly as possible Mm -hmm. to lock you in. Mm -hmm. And then once you're locked in, how they make you feel like you're going crazy Mm -hmm. and, you know, really get us there. Um, And then how you were able to escape. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the I was friends with this person um, before I, I wasn't close friends with this person, but we had we knew each other, and then we kind of matched on a on a dating site and started hanging out, and it was really convenient because we both worked for ourselves and we lived very close. We lived one neighborhood apart. Um, things got really hot and heavy, you know, lots of physical affection and time spent together. Um, you know, love bombing with gifts and introductions to interesting people and, you know, going to parties and, you know, just whatever it just seemed so magical. And it was one of those things of like, where have you been my whole life? Uh, this is, you know, it's like, I feel like I'm the center of this person's world and this person's so great. And then I remember traveling to, to Texas and coming back from Texas. And instead of picking me up from the airport, it was like, Hey, get yourself home. And then when I walked into this person's apartment, it was just like, night and day difference all of a sudden you know this look of complete disgust and it was just like wow you know what happened here so that was the moment the mask came off and i was just like okay i'm out of here but unfortunately at that point we were uh we're pregnant uh and i found out the next day and uh wanting to be a stand-up guy i thought okay well now we need to make this work because you know we're having a kid and uh the the that's when it really got crazy you know um pregnancy is a time of intense uh change in the body and hormones and all of this and i thought oh well you know this is all gonna get better when uh the baby comes and you know we'll focus on that and that wasn't at all the case you know we didn't um things never got better they continued to get worse and worse and worse and at a certain point i was just like hey this is it you know i can't live this way And it was something that I was kind of building up to, but I wasn't in a position, you know, it's like as a, as a freelancer, there's rise and rise and fall when you're building up your practice. And so I was waiting for a time when I had the the wherewithal to make a clean break. And then one day I was just fed up and I just left, you know, and, um, that was it, you know, that was about three, a little over three years ago. Um, but, uh, it was very, very, very intense. I joke with people that it's like I have uh, no color in my beard, but I used to have, you know, uh, color in my beard. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's intense even just recounting it now. But uh, you know, long story short is that I was, uh, you know, love bombed really intensely. Uh, that was something that I wanted. You know, I wanted to feel really uh, cherished and special, uh, and uh, I got that. You know, and I got it for just enough time to really be on the hook. And, um, you know, in that time, uh, we got pregnant and, uh, you know, so this person's in my life forever. Yeah. Yeah. And we have a lot of mutual friends and it's like, it's, it's been this ongoing process of pruning friends who I think are potentially aligned because I just want to make sure that my world is as pure as possible with my own friends and people that really support me. And, um, you know, to the, the theme of this, uh, you know, this, this community is that I, 
just left in a, not impulsively, but I just left and it was hard enough to leave because, you know, I knew I was going to have to fight for my child now, um, with a person who, uh, had very persuasive powers of, you know, manipulation over me and other people and was, um, knew I'm going to hold my, my child hostage basically, um, to get back at me or to have leverage over me. That was a, that was a, not a decision I took lightly. Um, and you know, nobody, nobody, you know, like you said, people have high value, uh, who narcissists attach themselves to, but, uh, nobody's perfect. You know, people make mistakes. People do things that, um, they regret later, um, uh, unforced errors, if you will. And so I was really second guessing myself for a long time about what, what's going on here, uh, what's best for my son, you know, what mistakes have I made to, to lead to this point and how am I going to, um, how am I going to lead a life going forward? And so it took a lot of conversation with a lot of people to start to see the picture more clearly. And again, to get to a place of just focusing on myself. And I would say it was the most intense year, year and a half to get to that place of like, let me just build myself up and not worry about this other person, you know, but you leave the situation thinking like, oh, this person just, you just think so much about like all the things that they've done wrong to you, all the lies that you were told, all the lies that you believed, um, keep finding things out, you're ruminating. Um, but once you stop doing that and just start focusing on like, who am I and what do I want to become? That's when the light starts to shine a lot brighter. Yeah, I mean, but just the fact that you're saying, you know, what mistakes did I make, you know, things like that. I mean, no narcissist is ever saying that to themselves. Right, right. You they know, don't reflect, they don't self-reflect. <laughs> it's always, how can I blame somebody, you know? Exactly. That Who's to blame for this? Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, that, that self-awareness, that's, that you know the self-reflection that never happens you know with a narcissist you know yeah um i i remember that you talked about being at a friend's house right after mm. mm -hmm. you left and um hearing footsteps oh yeah yeah talk about that okay so uh i you know, uh, before the, the, the final separation, uh, there were a couple times when I, th things just got too overheated and I thought, okay, this is it. I'm out of here. And I didn't really have a plan, but I was like, I cannot be in the situation anymore. I had a friend who had an extra bedroom and went to this friend's house and their, their bed was on a loft above this extra bedroom. And I remember them coming in in the middle of the night to go to sleep and the footsteps going up the stairs just made my heart pound because I thought I was back in the apartment I shared with the narcissist and that we were going to get in a fight even though it was like three o'clock in the morning because it was very common to have fights start at three o'clock in the morning and the narcissist would throw the lights on and say we're not going to sleep until we deal with this and it's just like you know no no good conversation ever uh, resolves itself at three o'clock in the morning when someone's in bed but I was so accustomed to that. And I was so accustomed to, you know, literally walking on eggshells and hearing this person's footsteps and just thinking, oh, this person's gonna, you know, the narcissist is gonna come into the room where I am and minding my own business. And they're gonna flip out because my socks were on the floor in the bathroom or, you know, there's a dish in the sink or some, you know, whatever arbitrary rules, but they're just gonna start, you know, hauling off on me. And so I felt that and, uh, you know, that, extreme paranoia and that PTSD, you know, of like, uh, like people that were in a war. Yeah. My heart was pounding and I was sweating and all this, uh, but people that have been in a war, it's like, if they hear a car backfire or they hear a loud noise, they think they're back in the trenches and people are throwing grenades at them. And so that's exactly how I felt at the time, you know, and it took a long time to really let my body unwind from that high level of stress. Yeah. It was like on a cellular level almost. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, and so it, I mean, and, and even now, like for the people who can't see you, because we're on a podcast, sure. you know, for most of the people who are listening, 
you know, as you're describing it, I can still see like how it still kind of hits you physically as you describe it. Oh yeah. I mean, the worst thing for me too, as a man is that it's like, Oh, no one's going to believe you if you say you're the the victim here, you're the one being abused. And also, it's just like in in any other situation, if someone is like, just uh, antagonizing you in that way, you have a right to defend yourself. You have, you know, like if if some random person came up to me and was like hitting me and, and uh, you know, getting in my face, then I would be able to defend myself. But in a in a domestic partnership, you can't do that, you know, then as a man, the finger is naturally going to be pointed at me. And so the having to restrain myself so much and talk the situation down, if at all possible, and if not talk it down, leave the situation. And as I try to leave the situation, the narcissist actually blocks the door, physically restrains me. And it's like, no, you know, so it's like, um, uh, you know, I, I figured we'd probably talk about the Depp and Heard defamation case, but it's like, you know, it seemed pretty clear from some of the testimony and some of the recordings that, you know, he was trying to get out of physical altercations and was unable to get out of physical altercations. And that's something that's very relevant to me where physical altercations would happen. And it's like, as the man, I'm naturally going to be, uh, you know, pinned as the aggressor when in fact I was being aggressed and yeah. uh, I can't, you know, can't physically escape. It's like, I don't want, don't want my infant child to be exposed to this. Uh, don't want to be exposed to it myself. And, uh, you know, not being able to leave or having my keys hidden on the way out. Things like that would happen. Or being chased out of the uh, apartments. Uh, and how tall are you? A little bit over six feet. Okay, so. okay. so you're a little bit over six feet tall. And how tall is mm -hmm. she? Five three. Five yeah. three. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so you know. significant size difference. Yeah. And I've represented, you know, guys like that. And and it's, you know, it, it's never a good situation. Mm -hmm. You know, especially if, you know, cops show up and they see mm -hmm. that kind of situation. I mean, it's just yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I called the police and uh then the narcissist called afterwards so now they don't know who to believe you know right um and the narcissist threw a statue at me and uh told the police uh, i didn't throw a statue but i do throw plates you know i mean uh, i had a guy one time where he would he literally had his phone on the whole entire time mm -hmm. and he was like she's attacking me she's attacking me and she's like, that's right, I'm attacking, I'm attacking. Mm. And she had even grabbed a knife. And wow. he ended up with a restraining order against him. Wow. Yeah. It's so crazy, you know, because the police, they asked me, were you injured? And I'm like, not really, you know? But it's like, do I have to be injured for this to be completely inappropriate, you know, um, for me to get some protection? Because, like, yeah, I mean, I just the restraint needed to be on the receiving end for so long and uh, uh, do nothing. You know, it's just so, 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 so hard. So um, that's still in my cells. That's still in my body. You know, um, I think that will leave my my body and my biology eventually. But it's like, yeah. 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 Well. Of course, you're going to yell, you know, uh, if someone's yelling at you and you're fed up, you're going to yell, but that doesn't, you know, like it doesn't help anything. And then, uh, you know, stopping from escalating any further, it's just like, okay, well, I'm going to leave. Somebody needs to leave. Uh, but, oh, yeah, that, that brings back memories still because it's only been three years. But, uh, yeah, once I got out of that situation and things calmed down and it's like switching to uh, – text only communication um helps one form one form i always say yeah one, one form, form. Mm -hmm. <laughs> definitely one only one form of communication no uh no in-person communication except just like you know parallel parenting yeah is a must with narcissists so, yeah everything's in everything's in writing because it's like no, you don't I have to respond narcissists 
it's like getting arrested. Everything they do and say, you do and say, will be used against you. Yeah. So it's like you can react, but you, or you respond, but you don't react. You know, it's like you right. can wait 12 hours. You can wait, you know, if something's incredibly urgent, don't then, defend yourself. Yeah. That's what they want. Mm -hmm. Just like pull you into the mud. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're dealing with a narcissist, which I'm sure you probably are, or you wouldn't be watching this video, then you know what it's like. And almost nothing you think could possibly shock you about them because they're just heinous and awful to deal with. But there are some things that will absolutely shock you about narcissists. So hang on and let's get started. So the famous author, Gore Vidal, actually once was quoted as saying, you can always spot the narcissist in the room. It's the person who's better looking than you. He was joking, of course, but the, the best jokes always have, you know, that grain of truth in it. So the narcissist is the person that wants you to believe and wants to convince you that they're better than you in every way and that you are somehow less worthy than they are, have less value than they do, because that's what they really want you to believe. The first thing I want you to know is the first shocking fact about narcissists, and that is how many of them that there are. So I'm going to go through some facts with you that I think are pretty shocking. One is that approximately 6% of the population has actually been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. And so if there are 360 million people in this country and 6% of them have been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, that's six, nine, oh, excuse me, 19 million, 500,000 people. And if each one of those people just narcissistically abuses five people in their lifetimes, that's close to 100 million people. So just think about that. And if you apply that same formula to the population of the world, which is 7.5 billion, are you ready for this? 6% of 7.5 billion is 450 million people okay, that have this narcissistic personality disorder. And if they, if you actually overlay the number of people that lack a conscience or are actually sociopathic as well, then you are up to 690, uh, 697 million people who lack empathy or without a conscience or have narcissistic personality disorder. And if each one of those people just emotionally abuses five people in their lifetime, which is probably a low number, then you're actually talking about the potential damage of over 3.4 billion people. Yes, this is the secret, the secret global pandemic. And I just want to give a shout out to my friend, Bree Bonche, who is the um, licensed clinical social worker and the uh, designer host of Narcissistic Abuse uh, support day, which takes place on June 1st of each year or somewhere around there. And I will actually drop a link below if you are interested in signing up for that free webinar that she hosts every year. I will be taking um, part in that this year. So and that's from Brie Bonche. So that's fact number one that I think is absolutely shocking. The next thing that I find absolutely shocking about a narcissist is that it has nothing to do with genetics. It has, well, very little to do with genetics is what they think. It has everything to do with childhood. And the other shocking fact about their childhood is it doesn't necessarily come from trauma. Yes, it can be from having a traumatic event or if things happen in their childhood, but it can also be from having parents who were actually overindulgent with them and gave into them too much or told them how amazing they were in every way. But the, here's the really key thing about that is that they were praised constantly for the things that they did externally and they weren't given any sense of feeling uh, valuable 
on the internal. And that's the thing about narcissists is they have no internal sense of value. And so if they were raised in an environment where everything was about the external, how did you look? What kind of grades did you get? Then they might have been ended up being raised with this feeling of a lack of internal sense of value. And um, so that I think is actually pretty shocking as well. The other little thing about their childhood is that all children are sort of narcissists as well as especially teens. And so, you know, it's part of the, the development of the human brain and the human emotions to, you know, start to develop a sense of yourself by being kind of narcissistic and feeling that the world revolves around you. And it's very common for two-year-olds to think that or even 15-year-olds or 16-year-olds. So the thing about narcissism is that while it starts in childhood like that, it actually can't be diagnosed until one becomes an adult. And number three, the shocking thing about narcissism is that it's actually not necessarily an unhealthy thing. Just like a lot of other things with personality types, and, and narcissism is a personality type, it's actually a trait, uh, unlike some other mental disorders, they, the, the thing with narcissism is that we all kind of have an element of narcissism in us. We actually all want to feel seen, heard, and know that we matter. And we, we actually all want to be validated by people. And so there's a continuum of narcissism that's partially healthy. It's when it gets into the illusions of grandeur and when you're actually feeling no sense of empathy for another human being and you devalue, degrade, and discard other human beings it's to the point of emotional abuse that you're actually inflicting on these other human beings, that's when that level of narcissism has risen to a level of being unhealthy. It becomes unhealthy or pathological in the sense that they start to believe that their own pain, their feelings are actually more important than others. And they, they give no credence or credibility or validation to others for their feelings or for their contributions or their achievements. That's when it's pathological and that's when it becomes unhealthy. So, and, and, and that's where you start to look at the scale of what a narcissist actually is. And I have a video on, am I married to a narcissist? And I actually go through the seven, seven different personality traits that psychiatrists look at when they are actually trying to determine whether or not somebody is a narcissist or not. And I will drop a link to that video below. You're going to want to check that out. And if you are a victim of a narcissist and you are so ready for change in your life, give me an I'm ready in the comments right now. The fourth most shocking thing about narcissists is one of the things that I actually found the most shocking when I really started to learn about narcissists because I had to deal with them so much in my law practice. And that is that they're actually the most scared, most insecure, most fragile personality on earth you are actually so much stronger than they are. You're the stronger one. You're the more secure one. They know that, and that's why they were attracted to you in the first place, because remember, there's this symbiotic relationship between narcissists and empaths. And I talk more about that in my video on the covert passive aggressive narcissist. So you're gonna to wanna to check that out. And I will drop a link to that below as well. But just remember that you are probably an empath because uh, that's what narcissists are mostly attracted to. They want the person who has the qualities that they don't necessarily have. And they glom onto you and they just kind of drain the life out of you. But that's what's happening in these uh, relationships. Underneath it all, there's this fragile little personality, an empty shell that feels no sense of value. So they attach themselves to people 
or, or and people that they think are going to help them feel more valuable and they, so they need an endless amount of supply and they try to get that from that person they're tremendously insecure they're tremendously afraid of being rejected or abandoned and so they act in this heinous way all to protect their fragile little egos i recently had a conversation with dr romani and um as many of my regular viewers know that i um, did a lot of series with her and she, one of the things that she said that really struck me is that she said that the narcissist is actually a very simple personality to understand. They're not like normal people like you and I, where we are actually pretty complicated and there are a lot of different things that motivate us and a lot of different things that cause us to do the things that we do or, or want the things that we want. Narcissists are actually pretty simple. They're just wanting to try to get as much value from everything out in the world as they possibly can because they feel so empty inside it's all about survival for them so that's that's the uh, shocking fact um that i think is actually the most shocking and that is that they are the most fragile scared little creatures on the planet and number five this is the best one and this is where i come in and that is that they can be motivated. They can be motivated to behave in certain ways. And that in my world, I call that motivation leverage or strategy. Um, and if you create enough leverage and you create a, a strong enough strategy and you're anticipating what the narcissist is going to do and focusing on you and your case, which is my slay strategy, strategy, leverage, anticipate and focus on you then you will be able to get them to behave the way you want them to. They're basically two-year-olds in adult bodies, and um, you're, you're, you're motivating the two-year-old to stop having a tantrum. So when two-year-olds have tantrums, they fall on the floor, they scream, they yell, and they're really just testing. They're testing the parents to see how much they need to scream and yell in order to get what they want. And narcissists do the same thing. They're testing you. They're testing your boundaries. They're testing you constantly. And so when the two-year-old screams and yells and the parents give in and give the kid the lollipop, then the two-year-old goes, aha, so all I need to do is scream and yell and fall on the floor and make it cause a big scene and they will give in. So next time, I just need to scream louder, scream longer and cause more of a scene and they will eventually give in. So I'll just keep on doing this until they eventually give in. And that's what narcissists are doing. And so you have to kind of implement what we call a behavior modification system for narcissists and go, I'm not gonna do that anymore. I'm gonna do something else. I'm gonna actually motivate you into behaving the way I want you to behave. Here's a little kind of thing about narcissists that I also, I also think is sort of maybe shocking fact number six, and that is that they do know what normal behavior looks like because they play the part. You know, they may not be able to feel any empathy for you, and they may not be able to give you emotionally what you want. And they may be uh, act absolutely awful and emotionally abusive, but they do know what good behavior looks like. That's how they were able to love bomb you in the first place, in the first phase of the, the narcissistic relationship. Remember, the narcissistic relationship is love bomb to value discard. And they do sort of vacillate back and forth between all of those uh, different um, stages of the relationship. But just remember that they do know what they are supposed to do. So you can actually create enough leverage and enough motivation to squeeze them into behaving the way you want them to. And that, to me, is a positive, shocking fact about a narcissist.